I'm Erica Zabaleta and this is Ecosystems of California. We are in the San Francisco Oakland Hayward Metropolitan Statistical Area, or MSA, one of three MSAs that together contain more than half of California's population. We're in the south end of the city of San Francisco, a city of 850,000 people concentrated into 120 square kilometers or 47 square miles. You might not think it, but California is actually the most urban state in the U.S. As of the year 2010, over 95% of California's population actually lives in cities. So how are cities ecosystems? They're certainly very different from an ecosystem like a forest or a grassland, but they are ecological entities in at least two ways. First of all, there's ecology in cities, and you can see some of that all around me here. There's an incredibly high diversity of species, it turns out, that live in and around cities for a variety of reasons. And then there's the ecology of cities, flows and transfers of matter and materials and energy in and out of them that are driven by biophysical and social processes in and around the cities themselves. Let's start with the ecology in cities. So San Francisco, like many cities around the world, harbors really high biological diversity within its limits. Some of that diversity of animals, plants, microbes, and other organisms is in managed settings like parks that are there to provide aesthetic and recreational opportunities and to do things like regulate climate. There are also managed diversity in the forms of things like street trees that are planted with it in mind to make the urban quality of life higher. Streets and neighborhoods that have street trees tend to have higher air quality, lower temperatures in the summer, and overall higher real estate values than neighborhoods with fewer street trees. And then there are places that have unmanaged biological diversity, and that ranges from the tropical spider assemblages in the basements of the city of Los Angeles to things like the endangered plant species that occur only within the San Francisco city limits and are protected wherever they occur, whether it's on median strips on large roads or in parks and preserves. So why is there so much biological diversity in cities? Partly, it's because we introduce all kinds of things to cities. Often the diversity of trees within a city like Los Angeles or San Francisco is much higher than the tree diversity in the surrounding landscape. And that's because we're bringing in species from all over the world to plant in addition to the things that we might find there naturally. Los Angeles has over 500 documented species of plants that are available for sale in nurseries that people bring in and put in their yards. Partly, we tend to put cities in places that have a lot of diversity to begin with. San Francisco sits at the heart of a region with a mild maritime climate in a Mediterranean climate area, which is isolated from the climates around it, and in an area with a lot of topographic diversity at the end of a peninsula isolated from populations just to the north across the Golden Gate. So there's a lot of opportunity for diversity to collect here and for endemic species and subspecies to evolve. So it's not that surprising that San Francisco has species that are found nowhere else in the world. In the dunes here at the mouth of Lobos Creek in the Presidio, which is part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, is the only place in the world that you will find populations of San Francisco Lysingia, a wildflower in the aster family. The Presidio is also home to Raven's Manzanita, which is a species that at one point in 1987 was reduced in its global distribution to just one individual here in the Presidio scrublands. And then there's the Presidio clarkia, which is another wildflower that's found only on serpentine soils here and in a few areas scattered south of here within the city limits of San Francisco. Those are the most extreme end of a spectrum, but they're examples of the ways in which we tend to put cities in places where diversity also likes to be, in places with mild climates, with high habitat diversity, and with abundant food and soil resources around them. So those things tend to both attract people and to support a variety of wildlife and ecology in cities. Cities generally have an ecological footprint that's much bigger than the size of the city limits because in order to support such a high population density, they need to import a lot of things like food and power and then export a lot of waste. So to get a sense for what this ecological footprint looks like for a city in California, we're gonna look at two of San Francisco's important flows, the movement of water into the city and the movement of waste out of the city. We're standing above Hetch Hetchy Reservoir and the O'Shaughnessy Dam. And Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is the main water supply for the city of San Francisco. 
The dam was completed in 1938, and the site's particularly significant because the valley that was dammed and filled here was first described by John Muir as similar in its majesty to Yosemite Valley. So it spurred the first national debate in the United States over wilderness preservation versus development. And in the end, the earthquake of 1906 left San Francisco ravaged and made its water situation even more urgent than it had been before as its population grew. So in 1913, Congress passed the Raker Act, authorizing construction of this dam. Because it was so controversial in part, it took a really long time to complete. And so in 1938, the dam was completed. Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is about 13 kilometers or eight miles long, and it carries water over 300 kilometers to the city of San Francisco. Water leaves here. It's stored in Crystal Springs Reservoir, which is visible just south of San Francisco. And then from there, it's delivered to its two and a half million urban customers. The reservoir holds about 117 billion gallons of water. And this typifies this feature of urban ecosystems, this ecological footprint that they have that extends well beyond their boundaries. So we refer to cities as heterotrophic ecosystems. A heterotrophic organism is one that consumes food, it doesn't make its own energy. And a heterotrophic ecosystem, like a beach or a city, depends on inputs from the outside to sustain it. And cities in California, more than a lot of places, really depend on long distance capture and storage and transport of water. And that's partly because of the climate here. It's relatively dry in California. We have a lot of water storage and transport for agriculture. And the same thing is true for cities. Both Los Angeles and the San Francisco area depend on water that comes from many hundreds of kilometers or miles away. Cities throw away a lot of trash, but where is a way? For most cities, most trash goes to landfills, but trash in landfills generates methane, leaches toxins and other substances into groundwater, and mixes together materials in such a way that even if we could potentially mine landfills in the future, they're more difficult to separate. So it wastes a lot of potentially reusable material. The city of San Francisco is really unusual in having set a goal of eliminating all of its landfill waste by the year 2020. Its partner in this effort is Recology, a private firm that runs the San Francisco Dump or Transfer Station, which is where I am right now. These efforts have their roots in the scavenger services that arose in San Francisco following the 1906 earthquake, when the focus was much more on repurposing and reusing discarded materials than on sending them on a one-way trip to the landfill. We're here to visit today with Robert Reed of Recology, who's gonna show us around and tell us a little bit more about how San Francisco is dealing with its waste. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors made the most aggressive recycling goal on the planet. Their goal is to send nothing to landfill by 2020. It's incredibly ambitious. But you know what? If you want to make great progress, if you want to be really successful, you set a strong goal. The city reports that we're now diverting 80% of the waste generated in San Francisco into reuse and recycling programs and composting programs. So we're leading North America in landfill diversion. We're constantly looking, how can we recycle more? What about construction and demolition debris? Well, there's a lot of that type of debris in San Francisco, a lot of wood, a lot of metal, and we collect this in large metal bins and we built a construction recycling facility just to handle this kind of material. We run it across sorting lines. So one worker's job will be to pull off wood and another one pulls off sheetrock and another pulls off hard plastics. So we're getting most of that material recycled. San Francisco is leading North America in urban compost collection programs. So we're collecting food scraps and plant cuttings from every property in San Francisco. And we're turning all these food scraps into a beautiful nutrient-rich compost. We're keeping materials out of landfills by composting. We're returning nutrients to the soil. We're giving farmers alternatives to using chemical fertilizers. And we're saving tremendous amounts of water. Compost by weight is 50% humus, the material that's on the floor of a rainforest. Humus both attracts and retains water. So when it rains, the compost retains that water around the roots of the plant, so the farmer doesn't have to do as much irrigation in the hotter months. We hope cities around the world replicate San Francisco's urban compost collection program. Recycling creates 10 times more jobs than landfilling or incineration. 
So in San Francisco, in addition to all the great environmental benefits of our zero waste program, we've created a lot of jobs. Recycling doesn't just protect the environment, it actually lifts up lives. So there's a lot to the ecology in and of cities, and a lot that we haven't had a chance to explore yet today. For example, there are the transportation systems that move people in and around cities, the systems that bring food, electricity, and gas into the city, and the system that moves sewage out of the city, to name just a few. With the vast majority of California's population living in cities, we can't afford to ignore their role in the state's ecology or their potential to produce innovations that enhance it.